I've been afraid of success and love and failure until I met Jay. He taught me how to let all of that go. And he taught me about fear and love. So today, we're going to talk to the most fearless man that I've ever known in my life, Jay. In Eyes Wide Open, Volume 1, you wrote, Fear is an emotion you will feel occasionally. Just like sadness and anger, there are healthy versions that you will feel once in a while and inspire you to live better. Can you please tell us what you mean by healthy fear and how fear can help us live better? Sure. Great question. Well, first, let's do a test. Even though you have no background with this at all, healthy fear and unhealthy fear, I bet you can tell a healthy fear from an unhealthy fear. So let's say, for example, you're walking home, you're dressed to kill, and your heart gives a little tingle that says, you know, let's avoid that particular side street today. Mm -hmm. It's just a little tingle. It's pretty chill. There's no overreaction, no knee jerk. But it's that little frisson of fear. Okay. Is this a healthy fear or unhealthy fear? I think that's a healthy fear because it's warning me or or trying to help me so that I maybe don't put myself in a situation that I'll later regret. All right. Now let's say, for example, your daughter is playing close to the side of the road and you get like a flawless burst of adrenaline that tells you pull that daughter away now. Well, that also feels like it would be healthy fear. Because I'm listening to my intuition to pull her away. So, yeah, it feels healthy. Yeah, it's a smooth adrenaline burst, not some kind of traumatic, oh my God, the world is ending. It's just that that moment of act now yes. kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, healthy fear. And how about if you meet an awesome art dealer and they're offering you some awesome art pieces, but the price feels a bit high and you get a little stirring in your gut that says, hey, maybe don't empty your entire bank roll on this one single piece. It's okay to splurge, just, you know, pull it back a little bit. Again, it feels healthy because having respect for what's in my account, yeah, I'm, I, I wouldn't be making the decision out of fear. So yes, it feels like a healthy, a healthy fear. All right. So far, so good. Now, how about when your brain overthinks a conversation and your brain decides, I'm not going to express myself to my super loving, non-judgmental partner because of something someone said to me when I was three. Uh, Okay. This feels unhealthy. This feels like not the best choice because that's a ridiculous fear to have. Somebody with a wonderful track record. Yeah, that would be not a great, that would be Yeah. Or what about if your gut is telling you, start your dream business, pursue your dream business, take this opportunity, get this thing started, and then your brain stops you for a hundred different reasons, healthy or unhealthy? Yeah, it's unhealthy because you're, yeah, it feels unhealthy. I don't really have a reason why it feels unhealthy. And I I don't know these questions ahead of time, you guys. So I'm just answering from my feelings. So it feels unhealthy, like not the best fear. And what about if your heart is telling you to step up and ask somebody out or talk to them or make a connection? And then your brain comes up with a, a bunch of reasons that you're afraid to do it or you should back off or stay away. Something like, oh, they'll just say no anyways. Rejection hurts. It won't be fun. This is a bad experience. You should stay away. A whole bunch of fear-based stuff. Healthy or not healthy? That is not healthy. And that's all the thinking I had in my brain uh, before I reached out to you when I found your Instagram when we first met because I had all those, he won't like me. I don't know what you liked or what you didn't like. And I made all these fake stories in my head about why it was a bad thing, why I shouldn't reach out to you. So it was definitely unhealthy. All right. So you nailed it. Six examples, six questions, six tests, and you got every single one right. Yay. And I believe anyone else would too. I don't think you need training for this. It's natural for any human being to be able to tell what a healthy fear is and what an unhealthy fear is. We all sort of know deep down. Our conscience knows. Our heart knows. And did you notice a theme? All of the healthy ones came from your... From your gut, your intuition. That's... Yeah. Yeah. It came from somewhere deeper down. Inside, yeah. Yeah. Where the other stuff was more brain. like Mental surface stuff. Yeah. Mental surface chatter. Yeah. So hopefully it's clear that there are 
two kinds of fear, a healthy kind and an unhealthy kind, a kind that serves you and leads to good results and a kind that doesn't benefit you at all. And which one would you say is more common in society today? The unhealthy fear. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely more common. Before we met, this is where I, I spent my time. It was all in my brain and all super unhealthy fear. Like everything. I was afraid of everything. And I had all these silly reasons why I couldn't do stuff or when I wasn't the right person for whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Mental surface chatter and like mind driven fears that are unhealthy and don't serve you. And it's pretty obvious. I could give anybody similar examples from their own life. And it, and it would be obvious. It would be obvious to everyone watching which one was the healthy fear and which one wasn't. And so for all the listeners, most of this podcast, this episode is going to be about unhealthy fear because that's the one that needs solved. That's the one we need to address. That's yes. the one that deserves some tender, loving care, some TLC to help people navigate it. Healthy fears don't really need talked about. I don't need someone being like, well, what about if I need, I was scared for my child and I need to save them from the side of the road. It's like, yeah, that's a healthy fear. What up? We're not talking about that. It's not relevant. Right. Or, or, or a woman putting herself in a position. Yeah. An uncomfortable alley or something. Right. It's like, you know, yeah, we probably a healthy fear or you're you're about to step up and ride a wild horse and it's been kicking people left and right all day. And you're like, I feel hesitant. This might not be for me. Yeah. OK. Probably a healthy fear. Right. On the other hand, if a, a well-trained jockey is doing it and it's his job, Maybe it's not a healthy fear. Maybe for him, he's his gut is telling him to do it and he's afraid to do it because it's the owner's horse and he doesn't want to lose his job. So for him, not doing it would be the unhealthy fear. But the, the point is everyone can tell for them which is the healthy fear and which isn't. So then how can fear make our life better? I felt like in those examples, you could see how the healthy fear made your life better and improved your quality of life in a, in a variety of ways where the unhealthy fear definitely was a detriment. Yeah, but I also wanted to be really clear because I was super focused on your examples and understanding the difference. And so that part of the question kind of like slipped away. So I wanted to bring it. Back. All right. Good job. Way to way to look out for the audience. Thanks. Well, just to be extra clear, listening to healthy fear will improve your life. It brings good results in all of the examples I've outlined. You did. I mean, it does. Yes. Right. Yeah. And listening to unhealthy fear will lead to unhealthy results that will not benefit your life. So I hope this is clear. It is. Thank you. And real quick, just going forward, I'm going to refer to healthy fear as good instincts. Okay. It's great to listen to your good instincts. And we should have a clear difference between good instincts, which are awesome, and fear, which is bullshit. Okay. You weren't on earth to be a fearful person. Yes. Fear is ridiculous. Yes. Fear does not lead to anything good. Fear is the unhealthy fear I'm talking about. Yes. Good instincts are awesome. By all means, listen to your good instincts. Okay, I like that. This way, we can see the difference between the fear and the good instincts. Thank you. So, Rise Nation, are you using good instincts or a surface mental chatter which one are you using more often which one feels better to you i know for me that my good instincts feel better and that other fear <laughs> that's not so much i'd love to know in the comments what you think so i spent years afraid of love i was afraid to love myself and to love others i didn't think i deserved it and meeting you, you taught me I had to love myself so that I could love other people. And this was a huge game changer for me. But there are a lot of people out there that are afraid of love. So why do you think so many people are afraid of love, even though they say they desperately want it? Well, if we were to ask a therapist about their clients... Mm -hmm. They would give us a bunch of reasons, bad childhood experiences, neuroses, narcissism, trauma, poor role models, haven't been taught, etc. And that's great. But to me, it's just unnecessary complication because all fears boil down to fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Yeah. As we talk through this podcast, you're going to see how every fear boils down to fear of the unknown. Well, most people, they know love. Oh, no, they don't. Are you are you kidding me? Most people are clueless about love. They don't know what love is. They don't know what it feels like. They can barely remember it. They had no exposure to it, yada, yada, yada. They have a, a severe lack of practice, lack of understanding, and lack of knowing or knowledge about love. And people fear anything that is unknown. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. People fear what what's unknown. But it's the most primal most fear. Us, well, most of us would say that we understand love because we have our families and we've had relationships, and so. You know, oh sure. Love. So. You know toxic family bonds. You know being born into authoritarianism. You know being born into other people's agendas and fulfilling them to hopefully struggle through life and get what you want. But you don't know true self-love. Most people don't know what love is, especially self-love. Now, how could they know any other form of love if they don't love themselves first anyways? And so they're very connected. The lack of knowledge about self-love or love in general means that love is unknown, which leads to fear of love, fear of the unknown, fear of unknown things. Right. And since everybody's been raised to be clueless about love, they're going to be afraid of it. They're going to be scared of it. It takes a serious baller to step up and be like, you know what? I don't care how unfamiliar love is. I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to step up and experiment with this thing. I'm going to learn to love. I'm going to practice love. I'm going to master love. No one's doing that. They ain't doing that. Nobody's waking up and doing that. They're scared as shit, but they'll claim they know love. Oh yeah, I'm, I know love. Yeah, I'm all about love. Love's the greatest. Love's the best. Meanwhile, they stay miles away from it in all their behavior or the majority of their behavior. And so all these therapists, oh, they're neurotic. They had bad role models. They had traumatic experiences. Like, yeah, well, whatever, whatever. The point is they barely know love at all. And they're afraid of the unknown. And this will go for anybody you could show me. Pick an example. And I'll be like, yep, doesn't know love, afraid of the unknown. And people don't like simple answers and simple solutions, but it is. No, I think people are going to dislike this answer they're not gonna they're gonna say i know love you're wrong you don't know me but if okay they understood love they wouldn't fear it well they could they, teach me then yo teach me teach me love because i've been studying it my whole life practicing it my whole life it's my like my favorite thing to do is to do the loving thing be the loving person say the loving truth give the blessing to others give the value to others and i do it freely all the time mm -hmm. And the loving thing to do is give people the harsh truth. The loving thing to do is to tell them what's up. The loving thing to do is to point out that you're living in fear. You don't know love very well and you need practice. That's the loving thing to do. But if someone out there thinks they know more about love than me and they know love better than me, I'm open. Like I want to learn. I always want to get better at it. Correct me. Show me how I'm wrong. Write it in the comments. Like, but you better have your shit together though, because you don't pick a fight with like someone who studied this topic, right? You don't pick a, a fight with, with a logical, well-reasoned dude who's presenting his case in love, doing it to help people. Every other episode of this podcast is on point with its message and helping people. Why would I randomly change now? Why are you going to randomly call it out now? Because it ruffles your feathers? Because it offends you? Because you can't bear the thought that maybe you were raised not so great and you weren't given a great example of love? Look, it's not a big deal. It's pretty much everyone. Yeah. So you taught me that I can only love as much as I love myself. Facts. And so when we met, I loathed myself. I hated myself. Then you can't love very So much. like my idea of love, I thought I understood it because... I loved somebody and cared about them and I saw their potential and I wanted to grow our relationship and have a family with this person. But we were on two different paths. I wanted to do all those things I just said and they just wanted to sit around and make me do all that work and then them kind of coast with our, our ideas of love were totally different. I'm not saying one was right or one was wrong. They were just different. So when you taught me this, it made a lot of sense for me. And I, I stopped fearing it as much. I mean, I wasn't great for a really long time. But, and I still had a lot of things, uh, as you know, <laughs> to learn about love. But this, this really stayed with me a lot. The I can only love others as much as I love myself. And so if I'm looking in the mirror and I'm hating on myself and I'm hating my body and I'm hating whatever. It's going to be tough to love. Then I can't love you fully or my children fully if I'm, if I'm holding back from myself. So it's been an interesting journey to love myself more. And every time I catch myself uh, hating on myself, I remind myself that I love you and I want that love to grow and the love I have for my children as well to grow so that I better stop. So before this podcast, when I was getting ready and I was changing, 
in the bathroom, I took a video because I'm on a weight loss journey and I, I took a video uh, to see my progress. And old me would have picked apart this bit and that bit. But all I did was celebrate my body to myself. And I was, I said, look how far you've come. Like other people may not see the difference, but I see the difference. And I love myself enough to be on this journey and work on myself. But I couldn't do any of that without the lesson that you gave me. So I wanted to share that with them since we were talking on the phone. And that lesson helped me really let go of fear and love. And when you were gone, one of the things I, I worked on a lot was loving myself, which is why I started working out every day and eating healthier because it wasn't for you. You weren't here. It was for me. And those things, I knew that I was going to feel better and love myself. But the thing that, that I didn't know was going to happen was that I was going to let go of these little fears that I didn't realize I had about. So yeah, that's most people. They have a bunch of little fears they yeah. don't realize about love. And it adds up to them being afraid of love in general. Yeah. And and that fear, like you said, that like most people don't realize these little things. I didn't. We all know like people who are afraid of love and are like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of commitment or uh, I'm afraid of intimacy and, and that kind of thing. But like little, <laughs> little dumb things like what if I'm not good enough or I look, I look ugly when I'm swimming. Okay, so this doesn't seem like love, but I love to swim and letting go of, of that. Uh, who cares what I look like? If I'm enjoying myself, it really helps me love it even more. I stopped worrying about how I looked to do something I loved, and which gave me more love and, and filled me up. So, so all these little fears that we have, I think letting those go and actually first recognizing them first would be helpful. So... Yeah. And, and you did this. You did this and you weren't even trying. So thank you. My pleasure. And like like you pointed out, love is a spectrum. Like there's fear on one end and there's love on the other. But you're you're always choosing one direction or the other. So like love is a spectrum. You can be more loving or extra loving than you were yesterday or whatever. But the choice of fear and love is not a spectrum. It's binary. You're either choosing the direction of fear or you're choosing the direction of love. Oh, that's good. And so I consider myself quite high on the spectrum of love. Like I've studied it. I've practiced it. I've disciplined myself. I've applied it. I am happy to be corrected or learn a lesson or figure out how to be more loving at any time. And, and so this, this has moved me along the scale. But sometimes I still make unloving choices towards fear because I'm not perfect and I'm just a human and we're all just human and we're all uh, sometimes choosing fear. The difference is some people choose fear by default all the time over and over. And I choose fear once in a while, catch myself, correct it, feel shitty about like, damn, I chose fear and then oh, improve myself. I have to say like, and the moment you feel unloving or that you're moving in the fearful way, immediately you catch it and you'll say, I'm sorry I said that. I'm sorry I said to you. Is there something that I can do to change to be better? You've said that to me multiple times. You've mentioned it on other episodes before, but it's true. And I've never met anybody who said this to me ever. And I have such trauma in my past that these little things, they'd be easy for me to just brush off and be like, whatever. But you don't brush them off. You're like, no, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. How can I improve? And, and this is, if that's not the most loving thing I've ever heard, because the improvement isn't for me, for you to look, for me to like you more, or because no, it's th to improve yourself as a loving person. And that in turn makes me love you automatically. More. Like, of course. And just like vice versa, when I make changes for myself and it's loving for me, it makes you love me. Absolutely. So. And just to be clear, there could still be fears I have that I don't realize or little fears about love that I don't realize. So I'm not claiming that I've spotted them all. Oh, either, no. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. One might pop up, but I have done tremendous amount of work in this area. And so it's become less and less likely over time, which is a, a, a wonderful place to be. Agreed. And I encourage everyone else to do the same thing. I encourage them to practice love, step away from fear and get to a place where they rarely make the unloving choice either. That's good. Also, we all, most of us anyway, have experienced some sort of trauma around love, which is why we 
start becoming fearful of love. And this is normal. This is what happened to me. It happened to you. It happened to, it happens to most people. So I think recognizing that too and having some grace with yourself might be helpful. Sure. And it's a good example because say you spoke up to someone as a child and you got burned or slapped or whatever, some trauma because of it, physically or emotionally or whatever. Then you close up and curl up and hide yourself in a shell and rarely, if ever, express again. And then you get into a relationship and that behavior stays, that habit stays, and you're treating your partner like the abuser you had in your past, this is an unloving thing to do. This is not love. That is fear. That is a choice of fear. Because you're miles away from that trauma. You're with a new person who's totally different. D the reality is you're going to have to open up and be vulnerable again one day. I mean, I guess you don't have to, but... If you want a relationship, you will Presumably, you're going to have to. And so the longer you draw that out and, and wall up, the more trauma you're inflicting on others, the more you're forcing this person to deal with your shell and your walls. Instead, the loving choice would be to take stock of yourself, be honest, and admit that it's on me to open up. No one else can make me. I shut down many years ago. It's on me to open up now. And even if I have to take small baby steps or become vulnerable or whatever, the loving thing to do is be bold and put myself out there again, even if it hurt me again. Like, life is hurt. Like, hurt is part of life. If you fall off your bike, you have to skin your knee and get back on. If you get some water in your lungs while swimming, you have to get back in the water and swim again, or you're not going to live. Like, you won't ride the bike and you won't swim and you won't live life. And if you got burned in a conversation and you're, you're never going to converse again, that's that's no way to live. The loving thing to do is often the bold thing to do. And your good instincts are telling you it anyways. The mind chatter is saying, oh, we might get hurt again, yada, yada, yada. But your good instincts are like, just share your heart with this person. They're, they're super receptive. You're with someone who's much better than your previous abuser. So give it a shot. And even if you get hurt, it's still going to be a step on your journey. Like your heart knows what's a, what's a good hurt too, right? Your heart knows when it's good to get a little more water in your lungs just for the sake of growth. The loving thing to do is embrace that growth. Mm -hmm. And everyone can tell when it's a healthy fear, like a good instinct that's driving you forward towards growth or some bullshit unhealthy fear, mind chatter that's keeping you away from growth. Everyone can tell. Yeah. You are able to tell 100% accuracy. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And anyone watching, I know they can too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, thank you. So, Rise Nation, are you willing to put the fear aside to move yourself towards the loving side of the spectrum? Because being in the fear, I know, it does not feel nice. Even if you're in a relationship, are you willing to today take some steps towards the loving side? And if you are, I'd love to hear about it and, and your thoughts on this. I love being a spectrum, how it's fear and love on one side, because this I've never heard anybody talk about it before. So I really want to know what other people think. <laughs> so do you think that it's possible to be afraid of love and still be intimate with other people? I don't mean just sex. I mean, intimate the way we are. Wait, so just so I'm clear, are you seeing love as a scale of intimacy when relating to other humans? Like, is that what love is to you. Is that what's coming across when I say the word love? Well, you said before, alone, we were alone, that love is is a, is a spectrum, right? It's a scale. So to me, I'm assuming it's like on one side is the love I feel for my neighbors. On the other side is the love I feel for you. And so the intimacy levels are going to be different. But if I'm terrified of loving anyone, I can't have an intimate moment with my neighbor either. No, I got it. I, I see what happened. So love, real love, isn't just about relationships. Real love is a giant cosmic universal thing. Like it's this like God tier thing mm -hmm. and it applies to everything. Yes. Like an amoeba can be self-loving or it can mutate and do weird things or go against mm -hmm. itself. Right. A pet can be naturally loving or it can be trained by a human into some weird attack animal or right. something. Mm -hmm. So everything is on the, the love spectrum. Okay. Everything is either moving towards fear or moving towards love in every moment, in all ways, in all things. And human relationships is just one example of that. Okay. Well, I was talking about a human example of human relationships. Okay. So I'm happy to address that, but it's important to know that this is just an example and it could apply to anything. All the teachings I'm about to give or all the answers I'm about to give 
apply to all forms of love in all ways because the best definition of love I can think of is uplifting your vibe from wherever it's at. Because the ceiling is infinite. You can always be more loving. Right. And you can always be more fearful. Right. But as long as you're uplifting your vibe or attitude or something, your state of being, as long as you're uplifting your state of being in any moment, you're moving towards love. Whether that's uplifting your vibe in a relationship with another person or uplifting your vibe towards your body or uplifting your vibe towards a pet or uplifting your vibe regarding food or uplifting your vibe towards the workplace or uplifting your vibe when observing others. You know, if you go from judging others to observing others to celebrating others, you have just made a love journey. You've moved up the spectrum. Right. And you've uplifted your frequency or uplifted your approach or uplifted your attitude or uplifted your state of being. Upliftment is as close as I can think of for a synonym to love. And so we could rephrase your question to if you're afraid of uplifting others or self, can I be intimate with someone else? Okay. And it's like, I don't really think so. Not to any reasonable degree, because intimacy is an uplifting thing. As soon as you're intimate with someone else, you're going to be uplifting. But if you're afraid of upliftment, how are you going to be intimate? And even if you are intimate, like intimacy is a scale too. So where are you on the intimacy scale? Like right here, and then you be intimate or kept your same level of intimacy. But if you uplift yourself, maybe if we put a vertical scale, if you uplift yourself, and be bolder and take steps and be more intimate, then you put your fear of love aside a little bit and you've become more loving in that moment. Then you could backslide the next moment, throw a fit, close down, or you could turn it up the next moment, be even more intimate and share even more stuff, get even closer. True, true. And I just want to interrupt you for a second to say, do you see (laughs) this whole question, this whole interaction, can you see why we do this podcast i asked a simple question and i thought i was gonna get a simple answer and we're like on a whole nother explanation but this is my point because you see things in ways that other people do not i had not we've had a million conversations about love and i've been studying osho and david data and still did not get any of that kind of information from them and and i'm not like putting them down or no, they're just amazing. They're amazing. I'm just saying you have this perspective, this third way that most people just don't. Like I have never thought of any of this stuff. So this is great. Thank you. Thank please, you. Please continue. I apologize for interrupting. Oh, all good. That was basically it. You tell me the answer. Can you be intimate with other people while fearing love? No. Not really. Sort of. It's not a yes or no. It's you can be intimate with others to the degree that you're okay with love. And you will be unintimate or distant from others to the degree that you fear love. Yeah. Well, so this, it's going to match. I guess this is what I meant by no. So that if you're distant from love, if you're fearful, if you're so fearful of it, then you can have sex with somebody. Yes. But you're not going to be able to be intimate with them and share your thoughts and your feelings and your dreams and your hopes and your goals and, because you're afraid. You're and, afraid. And most people don't even know their hopes and dreams and stuff. Anyways, it takes self-love and self-exploration and introspection to even figure out most of those things. So it takes a bare minimum of love and self-love to find your purpose and discover your dreams and all this sort of thing. It's at least consciously. You might know, know them subconsciously, but you won't have a great time articulating them or communicating them to others if you don't love yourself enough to engage with them. Thank you so very much. So then my question for Rise Nation is where on the spectrum are you? Are you afraid of love? Are you afraid of it for yourself so that you can be intimate with other people and know yourself more? Where are you at on that scale? I'm still I'm still getting there. I'm still learning and I'm I'm still working on this. This is why I study David Data and Osho and and why we are have this question because even someone who's been studying it and we've talked about it a million times, I don't fully I'm not even there. So I'd love to know your thoughts on this. And also if you want this kind of juicy goodness, like it's unreal. Every time I think you're gonna zig you zag. Uh and I love that, especially on camera for everyone else to see. This is the whole reason I started the podcast. Imagine if I'm the only one getting this amazing information 
and then I don't share with anyone else. What kind of greedy person is that? So if you want to have more J in your life, and in your home, we have a book called Eyes Wide Open Volume 1 where we talk about this kind of juicy stuff and more. So the link is in the description to buy it. <laughs> and Jay just told me to remember that it's the world's first self-help coffee table book. It is beautiful with original illustrations and graphics by Jay. I edited the book or... If you want to talk to Jay one-on-one -on -one about your specific situation, whether it's about fear or love or business or whatever, then we also offer coaching one-on-one -on -one with Jay. Just shoot me an email and I'm happy to send it up for you. Okay, so one of the things that I was the most fearful of was failure. I was terrified of failing my whole life. And because I was terrified of failing, I didn't try a lot of things. A lot of things I really wanted to do, but you taught me how to move past that and see failure as a good thing. So what actions can we take to get over failure so we can be successful? Okay, first off, like I said back in question two, I think, y'all ain't doing yourselves any favors labeling all these fears. People can check out our, our episode on labels because they're the guns of language. You got to be careful with them. Yeah. Point is, all of these fears just boil down to fear of the unknown. Even fear of death is just fear of the unknown. Death could be an amazing thing, but no one knows what's on the other side. So it's very spooky. It's very nice. And so the actions you take to beat fear of failure or fear of intimacy or fear of whatever is just make the thing more known. Okay. And there's lots of ways to do that. There's big ways and small ways and ways you can do from your couch and ways you can do out in the world. There's tons of ways to make the unknown known. Mm -hmm. But just to prove that every fear is fear of the unknown, including fear of failure, mm -hmm. name something that you were hesitant or afraid to do because of failure. We, you don't have to do it if you're uncomfortable. No, it's okay. We could go a different direction. I'm afraid to fail with the podcast. All right. It's pretty real. <sighs> okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, no, all good. Okay. So what if I guaranteed you that by failing the podcast, three known things were going to happen? Three known things were going to happen. One, Jeff Bezos would auto deposit a billion dollars into your account <laughs> because it's part of some special project for entrepreneurship he's, he's secretly running. Okay. Two, you'd be automatically taught the correct way to grow and succeed at podcasting by a pro podcaster like Joe Rogan or somebody. And three, no one would ever know you even failed. It would be erased from the internet. Nobody would even know. It would be like you were starting fresh. So these three known things now about, about podcast failure, well, wouldn't it make you want to fail? Yeah, it sounds pretty good. Yeah. Right, but only because you know, like you know what's going to happen. Or we can even make it three terrible things are going to happen, but you still know. One, you know that it will be a black mark on your record or past. Two, you know that you'll have to find another source of income. And three, you know that some people will gossip behind your back. But that's it. That's all that's going to happen. If you know these three things are guaranteed to happen, are you still afraid of failing the podcast? No, because I can handle all those things. Right, exactly. You're like, even though these are three terrible things, it's not that scary. I can handle all three of those things. But whether it's three good things or three terrible things, you're still secure. You're still confident. You're still happy. You're still all good. I I'm happy to tackle this, this podcast. But it's when there's like a fourth mystery thing. As soon as you throw the fourth mystery thing, like, will I lose my partner? Will I lose my family? Will I... I don't know. Will I, I don't know what's going to happen. As soon as you have the fourth mystery thing, what happens? The fear of the unknown and you get scared. Yeah. And, and then. <clears throat> and now you're afraid to fail at podcasting. Right. But there's tons of failed podcasters out there. Nothing bad happened to them. It's all good. Yeah. They find another thing. They pursue another dream. They have another thing. They attract another partner. They do all that. Th they just live happy lives. Ain't nothing wrong with failing a podcast. It's great. Yeah. It's a great it's a great, it makes a great chapter in their biography. But if you see a mystery thing, or if you perceive a mystery thing, an unknown, mm -hmm. doesn't matter if I tell you it's great. doesn't matter if there's other failed podcasters. For you, the fear remains. Because the main thing is a fear of the unknown. Yeah, because I don't know what will happen after. 
Yeah. If you step up for bungee jumping and you know the worst thing that can happen is you can die, people are happy to bungee jump because they're they're okay with this. They're like, yeah, that seems I might die. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Like at least it's known. It's known what the worst case scenario is. Yes, yes. But not knowing is what keeps people from doing stuff. You get in a plane and you know it could go down, but you're okay with that. And the knowing makes the fear disappear. Yeah, anytime I've flown, I've known that that's a possibility. Yeah, and you know what you would do if it happened, and you know how you would play it out. And like yeah. just running through the scenario in your head or having the, the tutorial from the stewardess kind of takes away most of the fear. Like, yeah, yeah, I know. And I saw Lost. Yeah, exactly. I saw Lost. I know, I know, I know yeah. about this. Even if you don't really know, even if it's made up knowledge. Yes. Just. Mm -hmm pretending you know is enough to kill all the fear yeah, yeah so like when you're on the plane if you go get a tutorial it gives you some knowledge and you feel more comfortable or you go watch a hollywood movie about planes like lost or whatever you watch a tv show mm -hmm. and you feel like you know what's going to happen and so the fear goes away so your your question what actions do we take to get rid of the fear of failure it's like, give yourself knowledge. Go read stories of people who failed at that thing. Most people who fear these things don't go and read stories of other failed people, but they should because then they learn like everyone picks up the pieces. Everyone recovers. Ain't no thing. Not a big deal. Go watch some movies or, or TV shows where that very thing happens. Yeah. I was homeless for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to me. Like I'm never afraid of being homeless again. But do you know why I'm so fearless about being homeless? Because you know what it's like. Exactly. What's going to happen. I know all the ins and outs of it. Even if it was in a completely new city or environment or something, even if I was homeless in the forest and it's completely different from how I was homeless before, I still generally overall have knowledge about it. And I'm like, just knowledge makes me comfortable. I've seen farmers, I've seen uh, Bear grills or whatever. I, I I know, and I don't know what would happen. Like, maybe I would do terrible in that situation, but it doesn't matter. My fear is gone. Yeah. Like, the question of fear isn't how would you do in that situation? The question of fear is, are you afraid of this thing existing on planet Earth? And most people are afraid of things existing. But once you have knowledge, you're not afraid of it existing. I'm not afraid that plane death exists. It's a thing. Right. But I'm not afraid of it. Now, I don't know how I do in that situation. So maybe there's a bit of fear of the unknown. Like, how would I do? But I have knowledge of this situation and it doesn't scare me. And as a kid, you love the unknown. Anytime something was unknown, you would just go make it known. So your fear went away. Yes. Yeah. What does what this hot stove do? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And as soon as I have knowledge, now I know about the stove. I know exactly what happens. I know I heal just fine. And I know I should probably avoid it in the future. Like, there's no more fear of the stove ever again. You're just like, eh. Yeah. Aside from a few people who get scarred and don't make it more known and they don't learn to navigate the stove or manage the burners or whatever. If they don't learn any of these things, then they just think it's some scary Bernie thing and they stay away forever. Yeah. They get traumatized. But if they go and study and learn and get a tutorial and learn basic fire safety, all of a sudden the fear goes away. And they're like, yeah, I'm happy to use the stove. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Every fear is fear of the unknown. And the, the solution to every fear is to make it more known. And you can do it in so many ways. If you really care about this, you'll get creative and you'll come up with a list of ways to make it known. You don't need me to spoon feed it to you. Someone who cares to defeat their fear has a, has arms and, and a brain and whatever, and they can write down their list of ways to make this more known. It shouldn't be me doing the work. Thank you. So I've heard people say that they're afraid of success. Is this a real thing, though, or is it just secretly the fear of failure? Well, hold up. Didn't you tank one of our businesses because you were afraid you'd be too busy and have a full schedule? <clears throat> yeah, I did. So you were afraid of succeeding. I wanted to get as many clients as possible. Yeah. You were secretly like, hell no. Let me stay away from that. Okay. I'm going to keep this on the down low. We'll get one new client tops. I'm, I am not effing with this. Fair play. I got really busy when we started getting clients and I was afraid that I wasn't going to have time for all the other things besides client handholding. So yeah, you're right. All right. And second, didn't you tank one of your weight loss attempts because you were afraid you'd have to get a whole new wardrobe? Yes. Uh I was afraid I'd have to get new clothes and I didn't have the resources at the time for a new wardrobe. Yeah. So screw it. Let's just stay away from weight loss then. <laughs>
I'm afraid of getting slammed. That's for sure. And I'm afraid of making money and getting clients too. Do not want to get too busy. You are clearly afraid of success in many areas and possibly still are. I don't know. No, because now I know the more stuff I have to do, I'll just hire someone to help me. Oh, so now you know what's going to happen and how to handle it. And because you know, the fear is gone. Yes. Oh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. So then it is a real thing. Then it's it's not the same thing. As a fear. But it is the same thing. They're both just fear of the unknown. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> okay, okay. If okay. I succeed and get all these clients or lose all this weight and I don't, know what I'm going to do if I fail at podcasting and I don't know where's the common denominator here are you seeing the pattern so then you're saying all fear is just I mean I know you've said it before but like with this I understand more so it's all fear of the unknown exactly that's why I say understanding cures all fear because as soon as you understand something whether it's bungee jumping or flying in planes or hot stoves or failing a business or being homeless as soon as you understand it the fear is gone even if it's pretend understanding from Hollywood you'll still have no fear okay I understand couldn't be simpler yeah, you're right all right so rise nation do you understand too that all fear whatever it is love success failure relationships confrontation whatever it is it's fear of the unknown and if you do understand i'd love to know in the comments what your plan is to tackle that to know okay i'm not afraid to fail i'm afraid of the unknown so what are you going to do about that fear or whatever fear and if you want to share in the comments or you don't, send me an email. Let's talk about it. Okay. So one of the amazing things that you taught me was there are only two emotions, fear and love. And we talked about both today. But can you explain exactly what you mean by this concept? Sure. I just say that for a catchy short form or a punchy phrase, right? There's only two emotions, fear and love. Mm -hmm. It sounds awesome. And it really does sort of make the point, but there's nuance to it. And it can be confusing if you don't fully understand it. What I mean is there's two directions of emotion. Like I said earlier, it's a spectrum and there's a scale and you can move your attitude or vibe or mentality or state of being or whatever you want to call it towards the fear side of the spectrum, or you can move that towards the love side of the spectrum. And as you move, we human beings give labels to each of these emotions on the way. If you're right in the middle of the spectrum, you're, I don't know, bored or content or neutral or blah or something like this, mm -hmm. just existing, and you move a bit towards love, you've gone from existing to interested. Right. And so we call that interested. And that's a different emotion because there's a further emotion where you're engaged right? Now I'm engaged. Right. And then there's a further emotion where now I'm excited. Like I'm actually anticipating or excited or something. We have all these labels and all these labels are just labels for the little slices of color. It's like if you had a rainbow spectrum, I could say, oh, this is a spectrum of colors. It goes from red to violet. But an artist or a colorologist would want to label every single one. They'd want, they'd want periwinkle and lilac and sea foam green and <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so a therapist or a coach or a writer might want to label all these different little emotions along the way. But for practical purposes, for living, it's not so important to label all these things. You just need to go. You just need to know how to go from red to violet. You need to know how to go from fear to love. The journey is what it's all about. Label the steps along the way, whatever you want. I don't care. And so when I say there's only two emotions, what I really mean is there's only two directions of emotion. And you can move your emotion in one direction or the other. You can move your emotion towards fear or towards love. And all that really matters practically for a great life is that you're moving towards love. This will work wonders. This will create magic for you. And this is all that matters in every moment and in every situation. And you're given free will and the choice in every moment to move your state of being, to uplift it towards love in whatever you're doing, whoever you're thinking about, whatever topic is in front of you or you're focused on. And if someone wants to get into the nuance and the details of which emotions higher than which and what we could label them and what it is for you and what it is for them, I'm, you know, I'm fine to do that. But it's just like two artists arguing over a shade of red, right? It's not that beneficial and not that helpful and not that relevant most of the time. Those kind of discussions should only happen once in a while and only when you're 
a pro master artist, then you guys really do need to argue over the shade of red. The, for the rest of the people, the rest of the time, all that matters is, you know, are you moving towards violet? Are you moving towards love? What shade are we going for here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a great explanation and super helpful for me because to me, all the negative emotions our fear and all the positive ones are love so i'm always moving towards love and if i'm moving towards fear anytime then i'm doing what i can to, to change that to move back toward now this can confuse people mm -hmm. because for someone who's down by fear or guilt or blame mm -hmm. or powerlessness or something they're at the bottom of the scale fear is the bottom of the scale mm -hmm. powerlessness is the bottom of the scale of the spectrum and so for them you can't just say oh the negative emotions are fear and the positive ones are love because for them, a step up is is getting angry. A step up is I'm freaking sick of this and I'm going to turn my life around. Fair. I'm going to go start a protest. I am so angry. I'm going to punch a wall and I'm going to feel better. Like for them, that's actually a move towards love and hallelujah. But society doesn't like this. If you go from quiet and powerless and, and fearful to loud and angry, they'll try to nudge you back to fearful and powerless. They don't like it. But I like it. If I see it, um, if I see a depressed, fearful, powerless person who's actually getting angry about something, I stay away a little bit. Like I, you know, I don't get punched or whatever. But I'm, I'm like, hey man, that's a step up for you. Now, if I see my wonderful, lovely partner who's always happy and delightful, moving towards anger, I'm not so great and happy about it. I'm not thrilled about that. That's not a step up for her. That's a step down. They are not. She is not uplifting herself in that case. She is downsliding. And so everything is relative. And since you don't know a person's journey when you meet them, you can't tell it five seconds before that they were feeling powerless and down. Mm -hmm. And now they're feeling angry, but proactive. So the labeling of emotions and putting them into buckets of positive and negative, it's kind of helpful for learning the basics and stuff. It's helpful for you for your own purposes. Yeah. But, but overall, it can often confuse things and confuse people and keep them down in the fear level because they're never allowed to move up to anger. And from anger, they could move up to blame, you know, like I have someone to blame for this. And if I solve this, if I address this person, maybe I can fix this problem. And then they move to just overall frustration. Like, well, I don't blame anyone anymore, but I'm just frustrated with the situation. It's like, you've clearly come a long way. Yeah, That's fantastic. Okay. Please keep elevating yourself. Please keep uplifting yourself. Every moment, please keep choosing the love direction as much as possible. And most people don't have patience with this messy journey and they don't want to see people go through these emotions of anger and frustration and blame and so on. But if you can have patience with it and encourage people to do that, they will eventually move way over on the side of love to interested and excited and engaged and passionate and ultimately joyful and loving. But that's quite a journey. Yes, it is. It is quite a journey. But you can make it. Yeah, I'm really glad that you talked about that because me just saying that I understand for me because you've broken down this before and so I understand. So I want to know from Rise Nation, where on the on the scale are they today between fear and love? Call it whatever feels right to you. And what can you do to move one step or as many as you're comfortable with to move towards love that feels good to you? And I also want to add something. I don't want to call out my family, but it is what it is. When I started moving up from the scale, from the powerlessness and the fear, they definitely tried to hold me back because that's what they knew me as. And they didn't like me moving towards the fear. So I also. Yeah, they're afraid of the unknown. Yeah. They prefer the known. Yeah. They liked, even though I was mean and hateful and, and not a nice person. They prefer mean and hateful and not a nice person. Because they knew. At least it's familiar. Right. They knew who I was. So. I brought it up because I wanted to also ask Rise Nation if there's someone in your life that would rather see you on the fear end because of the familiar for them. It's okay to give them the finger and move steps towards the love, even if it's one step, even if it's to revenge. I mean, there's more steps to get there, but but even that is better than living in the fear and harmlessness. So. Yeah, and preferably don't act on those feelings. Yeah. It's a, no. It's, it's a, an emotional thank journey. You, thank not you. a let me go and get revenge first no. <laughs> and then blame people second. Yeah. To be very clear, all of this can be done in a very short time in your emotions yes. wherever you are. Right. Um, so if you want to share that, yeah, I'm, I'd love to hear about it. And, and you're not alone that if your family is the same. So it's okay. 
So I'm going to call them out. And I love you guys, but my mom and my oldest daughter are terrified of confrontation. They're scared to speak up for themselves and have dealt with a lot of BS because of it. So whether they watch or not, do you have any actionable tips and tricks for them to move past that? Sure. I'm happy to help. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Like I said before, it all boils down to fear of the unknown. So the narrative in their head very likely goes something like, if I speak up, others may feel hurt. If others feel hurt, they may leave. If others leave, I'll lose my family or support system or friend or let or life purpose or whatever they see them as. So I'll just shut up, avoid confrontation and deal with what I know. And what I know is repression. But since it's known, happy to do it. You know what they're not happy to do? Try anything else because it's unknown. Yes. And so you you see that people will stop experimenting or stop trying solutions or stop applying themselves with any effort. Because once they found something that's known, it's comfortable and familiar, and they'll just stay in it till their dying day. So this is what we want to solve. And since we understand that gaining knowledge, even false knowledge of some kind or half-assed knowledge or not quite complete knowledge removes fear, then this is where they need to start. Now there's, there's, there's another scale. There's a scale of knowledge. The lowest end of the scale of knowledge is imagining something. You don't know what's going to happen when you express yourself to your partner or your family or your daughter or whatever, mm -hmm. but you can imagine it and it's, it's effortless. Like it takes all zero effort to imagine something. You can do it with no time, no money, no energy, no resources, no supplies. You can do it from your bed, from your couch, on the ground, in a forest. It's it's the lowest effort possible. But it still takes a little bit of effort though. Some people even refuse to imagine things. Mm -hmm. Even though as a kid, our imaginations were crazy powerful and it's how we dealt with everything. We used them all the time. But say there's a confrontation looming and I'm interested in beating my fear of it. I'm interested in being more loving, having a more loving approach to it, having more love in my life and being the kind of person who can handle confrontation. Mm -hmm. The most toe in the water step, like the babiest of baby steps, is to imagine what's going to happen in that confrontation. Imagine me saying something, imagine them saying something back. If I don't like it, imagine myself saying something nicer and kinder or a different approach or different angle. Imagine them saying something back, imagine them responding nicer. Just get familiar, familiar, get, mm -hmm. get knowledge mm -hmm. of some potential ways this could play out. You could also imagine the worst case scenario. Well, worst case, they're going to yell at me and leave and we'll have to make up later, a year later or something or something like this, or they'll not talk to me for 10 years and I'll have to, it'll be a chapter in my book where I didn't talk to them for 10 years. Like you can imagine all of these things. Mm -hmm. Generally, it's better practice to imagine the most positive outcomes possible, but even becoming familiar with the worst case scenario is quite helpful. If you can imagine that, well, I guess I might die, but I'm going to try this you're already a step ahead of most people, okay. right? Because you're at peace with the worst outcome. Mm -hmm. Or even if I'm totally alone and I have to find all new family and friends, at least I'm at peace, like this could happen, right? It's far more powerful than just sticking with repression and fear. Uh, yeah. The person, the person who can step up the confrontation, even if the worst case scenario happens, is automatically more powerful than the one who can't even handle confrontation in any way, shape, or form. Right. Secondly, if you're past the toe in the water stage and you're like, you've imagined the confrontation a few times, mm -hmm. you can start journaling because journaling is a great way to express your feelings in a safe environment. So these people, they have some feelings and they sit on them or repress them or suppress them to avoid confrontation. But this just creates more and more pain and trauma. If they express them in an email to themselves or in a journal or a notebook that they burn afterwards or delete afterwards, this is huge because now they've gotten their feelings out. Plus, anytime you write something out, you write your own words out, you automatically become more articulate. You could try this with anybody. You can have them express something from their head then have them go write the same thoughts or expression or whatever, mm -hmm. and then talk to them about it again. And they'll automatically speak far more precisely and articulately and well about the topic. And so you're kind of preparing yourself for a great confrontation that goes smoothly because you've got your points down and you've ordered them well and you've gotten your feelings out and you're not so attached to it and they're not all clogging up your head and your emotions. They've become ordered and organized and smooth on the paper and you've had to edit them and rewrite them and choose different words. And so now 
you've imagined the confrontation going a few different ways, dipping your toe in the water. You've journaled the confrontation or your feelings about the issue, getting them out and getting them ordered. It's like uh, swimming in the shallow end with water wings. Mm -hmm. And then the, the best practice that anyone can do to get rid of the fear of the unknown around confrontation is to go have some confrontations. Practice. Practice. Y'all are grown-ups, man. Y'all can't have a confrontation. <laughs> what is this? Actually, you had me do the the journaling thing. You had me write an email to. Well, I didn't send it. You had me write for a couple couple times. Had me write it for people that I was really angry at. You don't even have to send it. Uh, yeah, and I sent it to you and, and not them, and it made me feel so much better. Even now, I know that after doing that if i were to confront them that i would like you said be more articulate and i know the point that i would be making even though it's been a long time and like i'm not going to see these people but i feel confident that if i i went outside and they were standing outside my front door i would know exactly what to say where i wouldn't get emotional and upset because i spent that time to express that in these emails and that was super helpful. And it let me let go of a lot, not all, but a lot of the anger and the hatred I had for them. Over time, those things lessened as well because uh, going back to the to the love and fear, I chose to, to move towards love more and more. And one of those things was letting, letting go of some of that anger for those people who really didn't do anything to me personally. Just those people that I love. So. Yeah. Well, that's really the ultimate choice is just <clears throat> uplift your vibe, like uplift your approach to any topic. If the topic is confrontation with person X, show me a better you. Show me a version of you that, that feels better about this, that has a better approach, a healthier approach, a more mature approach. You can choose at any time to approach this topic differently. No one's forcing you to approach it a certain way. You're not locked into it. You have free will. It might take a little effort, applied effort, or you might have to actually sit down and think things through or spend some time in meditation or something. But at any time, you can uplift your vibe and be more loving on any topic, including confrontation with person X. These four things would be my best approach and tips for, for anyone who's afraid of confrontation. And they will work. And if they don't, chances are 99.9% .9 that you have not applied them well enough or consistent enough or long enough or focused enough and that you, you kind of half-assed them and you weren't really in it. Yeah, practice. Okay, so do you have anything else that you'd like to say to our wonderful and amazing audience? Yeah. Life is a game of choices. We're all playing it. Every single moment that passes, you're either choosing to move towards fear or you're choosing to move towards love, whether you realize it or not. That choice to doom scroll for 10 more minutes, fear or love. That choice to avoid people and stay inside, fear or love. That choice to play League of Legends or Path of Exile, fear or love. That choice to have a heartfelt talk with your partner, fear or love. That choice to manipulate or guilt your partner, fear or love. That choice to suppress your feelings, fear or love. Most people don't realize they're making these choices, these fear or love choices, but they are all day, every day. Even the choice to just stay there and do your normal routine is fear or love. Are you on earth to do your normal routine? How long should you be keeping up your normal routine? Is the most loving thing to continue doing your normal routine? Only you know, moment to moment, if you're choosing to move in the direction of fear or choosing to move in the direction of love. I don't know. Sin doesn't know. Your family doesn't know. We may all like to chime in with our opinion and tell you what we think, but only you in your heart know if you're following your good instincts or surface mind chatter. Only you know if you're moving towards love or fear. Straight up, most people suck at life's game of choices. They really, really do. They choose fear all the time, but they don't have to. They only suck because they refuse to practice the game. They refuse to use the heart and mind and body and free will that they've been blessed with to move towards love, to become a truly loving person who thrives and blossoms. It's totally possible. It just takes some applied effort, some practice, and some willingness to make mistakes and skin your knees. But I believe that Rise Nation and you here watching are already doing better, already have a leg up. You're already better at the game, and you're going to continue to make better and better choices, to make more loving choices for yourself and for others, and to leave fear in the dust. 
And I'm so excited to see the great results you get because they're unfolding right now with every loving choice. The results are there. It just sometimes takes a keen eye, a practiced eye to see them. And pay attention. Good things are coming to you. Keep rising.